Welcome to Lifeline. We're glad that you're with us tonight as we study God's Word together. We're going to be transitioning tonight from anxiety to addiction. We've got a lot to talk about. We're going to worship together tonight, and then we'll get into our Bible study. And so let's open up with a word of prayer, ask God to bless our time together tonight, and then Ethan will lead us, and and it's good to see you tonight. Let's pray together. God, in the name of Jesus, we lift our voices to you in one accord, and I pray, God, that you would take our time together and use it for your glory and your honor. Teach us how to deal with anxiety and how to overcome addictions, for we pray it in the mighty, bold name of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing together. Ethan will come and lead us. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, come by what we for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us, whoever believes in him. Will live forever. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated, now it is well. I'm walking in freedom, for God so loved the world. So love the world. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. For God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son to save us forever. Listen, Him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated, now it is well. I'm walking in freedom, for God so loved, God so loved the world. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. You may be seated tonight as we get into our study. We are moving from addictions, or excuse me, from anxiety to addictions. And so tonight we'll pick up in Philippians chapter 4. And we're going to be moving to some uh, important things that help us to understand what's going on in the area of anxiety and addiction. So remember that our key words for addressing anxiety, and when you're dealing with these, uh, with anxiety, I want you to use these words to get you through it. Prepare, aware, care, guard, think, practice. Say them with me. You'll see them up on the screen. Prepare, aware, care, guard, think, practice. Prepare, aware, care, guard, Think, practice. 
And tonight, as we move through from anxiety to addiction, we're going to pick up in this passage of Scripture as we read together. And we're going to be looking at, in in this particular case, verse 8. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Not only does this have to do with anxiety, but it has to do with addiction. This not only has to do with anxiety, but it has to do with addiction. And so, and I will try to go through so that you can see that. We're going to read Philippians 4, 8 together. We'll try to go slow. I know we want to welcome you, those on site and those online. And here's what verse 8, Philippians 4, 8 says. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. And that word dwell is to think. That word dwell is to think. And so we want to, again, go over our words as we think about uh, anxiety and how to work through anxiety. And so we see those words together, prepare, aware, care, guard, think. What are we thinking? How many times have you said that to yourself or somebody has said that to you, especially during the negative times of your life? What are you thinking or what were you thinking? Why did you do that? And so we're going to talk about this word thinking tonight. Has to do with anxiety and addiction. Now hear me close. A lot of times people deal with anxiety by becoming addicted to something that will get them through their anxiety. And then a lot of people have anxiety because they realize I'm addicted to something and I don't know how to get through it. Maybe it's addicted to worry. Maybe it's addicted to food or to drinking or to drugs or to pornography or to sex. I'm addicted to this, so it's causing me anxiety. Or I have anxiety. I can't tell you how many times I hear people say, well, I have anxiety, and to get me through that anxiety, I I, I use my eyes, ears, mouth, mind, hands, or feet in an addictive way to get me through the anxiety. And so I want you to see how closely connected anxiety and addiction go hand in hand. And so a lot of times people are anxious and so they find something other than Jesus Christ to get them through anxiety with their eyes, ears, mouth, mind, hands, or feet. And then once they have an addiction, that addiction makes them anxious. So it's like a hamster running in a hamster wheel. It's just going to keep running until it's completely worn out. And that's why we have today suicide rates at such a high rate. And so we need to understand what's going on and how this works. And so let's talk through uh, tonight what should we think? How should we think? Because this is important. And notice that if you're following Philippians through, we've talked about preparing. And he told us how to prepare. Uh, We talked about uh, being aware. What is anxiety? He's told us what anxiety is. How to care. What to care for. Which the word anxiety is to care. I either care too much or too little. If I have an anxiety problem, it's because I'm caring too much or too little for something. And that goes back to the addiction. If I have an alcohol problem, I'm addicted to alcohol, then I care too, uh, too much for alcohol. Or a porn problem, then I care too much about the porn that I'm watching. Or I have low self-esteem and I'm beating myself up. I'm not thinking about the things that I need to think about, then I have, I'm thinking too little of myself. And so we've got to see the extremes on both ends and how anxiety feeds into addiction and how addictions support the anxiety. And so we come back to Scripture. What am I thinking? And so tonight we're going to talk about that. What am I thinking? What am I thinking? And, so, and, and this is really cool especially for me because of confessional discipleship, but this word to think, to think on, or to dwell, notice verse 8, Philippians 4, 8, finally, brethren, and he, he tells us to dwell on these things, to think on these things. This word for think is the same word that's associated with 
uh, logos, it's to think in our mind, what do we think? We think the things that we've heard, we think the things that have been said, we think the things that we've seen, that we're experienced with. Logic comes from this phrase as well. And so, uh, as you look at this Greek New Testament word, logisthe, logisthe, it means to think on, Philippians 4, eight. Now, when I'm going to think, there are three things that I need to look at. I need to outline my thinking. The when, the who, the what. When, who, what. Say it with me. When, who, what. When I think, what should it look like? Who or and who's going to do the thinking? That's going to be me. What do I think about myself and what? What do I think? So let's talk about the when, the finally. Notice verse 8 starts with the word finally. Okay, how many of you have ever taken a final exam? Go ahead and hold up your hand. You've taken a final exam. You know what that looks like. Finally, Paul is wrapping up what he's saying to the churches, to the churches at Philippi, and he says, finally, I'm going to teach you how to think. Finally, I'm going to teach you how to think. And so we need to learn how to think, finally. Now, the who, brothers, this is for Christian men and women. The what, the, excuse me, the when, finally, these are the final things. When I'm at the end of my rope with anxiety, then I need to go back and think, what am I thinking? When I'm thinking about addiction and the beginning steps of addiction or the origins of addiction, that usually starts with my thinking. Something's wrong when, with my thinking. When I'm doing something and it's, it's not an, a good thing and I'm doing too much or too little of even a good thing, then it goes back to my thinking, okay? So who, he's talking to brothers. This is important. Now let me say to you that I meet a lot of people that uh, most of the people that I meet are struggling with anxiety, but not all the people that I meet think that sin is sin. However, there are multitudes of people that do not believe in God. They will tell me, I believe in sin. I believe that there's sin. Why? Because they read about it, they hear about it, they're living in it. It's all around them. So they believe in sin even if they do not believe in God. But the problem is is that sometimes the things that the Bible says are sinful, the world says they're not sinful. They're not sinful. Somebody this week told me, I have this addiction, but I don't think it's sinful. I think I just need to learn how to control it. And so, and, and I said, well, if it's keeping you from God, and I quoted for them Philippians 4, 17. If you know to do the right thing, but you do not do it, it's called sin. You know to do the right thing, but you do not do it, it's called sin. We talked about that this morning. But let's look about and understand that we're talking about brothers. And so if, if, I'm a, if I'm a Christian, then the Bible has given me these biblical approaches to anxiety and the biblical approach to addiction. And so I've got to learn that and know what that means. Okay, so these are brothers. These are brothers of like face. Now notice these are brothers and the word used here is Adelphoi. Philadelphia comes from this word. This is a type of love, brotherly love. It's not agape. It's not God's love because God God never had any origins in sin. God never sinned. Say that with me. God never sinned. And so... As you think about agape love, the attitude, the actions, and the answers of God, then you think about love without sin. Love without sin. If I'm going to love God, then I need to love him with the same kind of love that he's loved me with, love without sin. If I'm going to love my wife, my children, you as my Christian brothers and sisters, then I need to love you with love without sin, and that comes from God and God alone. And I am convinced the more that I studied the Scripture, there are two words used for love in the Greek New Testament. One is agape. It's the love of God, the attitude, the actions, the answers of God. And then philios love, which is brotherly love. And sometimes we have to love each other in spite of our sin and sin nature because all of our brothers and sisters as Christians, or even if they're not Christians, but they're human brothers and sisters, they've all sinned. 
And so we're talking about people dealing with each other with being tainted with sin and sin nature. And I think that that's why God used the two words for love. Agape love and phileos love, brotherly love. Because we understand God's love. God's love is sinless. And God wants me to love my wife, my children with a sinless type of love. He wants me to love you that same way. But at the same time, I treat you as brothers and sisters that have been tainted with sin. Face it. We've been tainted with sin, thus the anxiety, thus the addiction. We're tainted with sin. If that makes sense to you, hold up your hand. That's important. Now, the word lust is not a word for, uh, a word for love, okay? Eros is that word, and the Greeks came up, the Romans came up with that word. It's not used for love in the Scripture. A lot of anxiety is built around eros. A lot of addiction is built around eros, but the word eros is never used for God's love. So now let's, we've talked about uh, the when, finally, the who, brothers and sisters in Christ, and the what. What should I think? And so we're going to start this list. It is a list of eight things. Do not get lost in the shuffle. You say, what does this have to do with addiction? It has everything to do with addiction because it starts with what do we think. Addictions are what are we thinking? How did we get there? How did I get addicted to something? Whatever it is, how did I get addicted to that? And if my addiction overshadows Christ, then it's idolatry. If my addiction overshadows Christ, then it's idolatry. If I am worshiping something other than Jesus Christ, then I've entered into idolatry, and yes, I'm going to be anxious over that. I'm going to have anxiety. But I'm also going to probably have an addiction because I'm not keeping Jesus Christ as my foremost purpose and primary focus. If that makes sense to you, say it does. Okay? And so we, we want to start with what are we thinking? What are we thinking? Okay? Let's start with the truth because 4, 8 says, finally, brethren, brethren, whatever is true. So I need to think the truth. I need to think the truth. Now, remember, this is very important. We won't cover all eight of these tonight. This goes to addiction. Remember that God had told Adam and Eve in the garden of Eden, you can eat of every tree but the tree of knowledge in the midst of the garden because when you eat of it, you're going to die. Satan, by this point, at some point, Satan is kicked out by the point that Adam and Eve have been instructed in the garden. He's kicked out of heaven. He's kicked out of heaven. He's a fallen angel. He's Satan. He's Lucifer. He's a fallen angel. I think Isaiah 14, 12 is a reference to him and the king of Babylon. But I think it's a reference to him because the king of Babylon had never been in heaven. But this, whoever this was had been in heaven. And he's kicked out. He comes in the form of a serpent. He can do that because he's a spirit. God had created the cherubim, the seraphim, the angels, and human beings. And he made these, these four by having spirit. And so he comes in the form of a spirit, an evil spirit, in the garden. The first thing that he does is he lies to Adam and Eve. And he says, if you eat of the tree of knowledge, your eyes are going to be opened. And you're going to become as a god. I, w- I want to be illuminated. I want to have all knowledge. I want to know everything. And I want to feel everything. And I want to do everything. And I want to say everything. And I want to experience everything. I want all of this knowledge. It's good. It's good. It's good. And that's what Satan sold Adam and Eve on. And so if I'm going to think something, I've got to think the truth. And let me say to you, because of the fall of man, Adam and Eve, and because of Romans 3.10, there are none righteous, no, not one. And Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Because of sin and sin nature, and because of Satan, then Satan will tell you lies about yourself. And lies about what you think. And lies about what you look at. And so people think, well... I can go out and I can have a drink and I can drink without getting drunk and there are very few people that do that. Drinking is not a sin according to the scripture. Jesus said to have a little wine, it's good for the stomach. But he said, do not get drunk. And we can think, well, I'm gonna drink without getting drunk and then get drunk and then think, well, that's okay. Boy, I got a buzz, that made me feel good. But the truth of the matter is, that's not the truth. It doesn't make you feel good. If you overdrink, you're gonna be deathly ill the next morning. It's called a hangover. And so, and then, and, and the same thing with anything that alters our minds or pornography. 
Pornography itself is one of the biggest lies that there is because the people that are doing pornography, most of them will tell you if they're being super honest with you, I'm not doing this because I want to do it. I'm doing it because I have an addiction now that I have to support and I'm only having sex with other people, people that I don't know in ways that I could never imagine doing that because I've got to feed my addiction. And you wouldn't believe how many people will tell you that porn actors, they've got an addiction problem with drugs and alcohol. And it's because they buy the lie. And now we're paying millions and millions, billions of dollars in the world on a lie. Pornography is a lie because sex instituted the relationship, the marriage relationship between a man and a woman. And so it goes back to what is true. And I can't tell you how many times people tell me today, well, I am this. And I will say, did God tell you that you were that? And the first time I did that, I, I will never forget, I was in a dry cleaners and I dropped some clothes off and, and I'd gone back to pick them up and they, they didn't get clean. And so I was pointing out to the individual that was waiting on me, these clothes didn't get clean and, and I want to bring them back. And I was nice about it because God's told me how to behave. And I was nice about it, and I said, hey, I want to pray for you. Can I pray for you? Are you a Christian? The person said, yes, I used to be a Christian. And I said, well, if you used to be, then you are, because the Bible says nothing can separate us from the love of God once we get it. If you understand that, hold up your hand. And this person said, well, I haven't been to church. I haven't talked to God because this is what I am. And I said, who told you that you were that? And this person started telling me, well, this person said this, this person said that, this is who I am. And I said, but did God tell you that you were that? And this individual said no, said a curse word in front of it, and said no. Because God is not, God should be the only one to give us our identity. Not anybody, not anything else, only God should give us our identity. And so we've got to think what is truth. And so whether you're dealing with anxiety and, that, and you're anxious over something and, and you're feeding that anxiety by addiction or you're anxious because you have an addiction, you've got to ask, what is the truth? What, what's the truth about what I'm thinking? What's the truth about what I'm thinking? And it goes back to Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself, God, neighbor, self. Do not beat yourself up. I can't tell you how many people that I know that are not thinking the truth about themselves. They're not reminded that God created them. And so we've got to go back and say, what is the truth about what I'm thinking? What does God's word say? And what does God's word say about who I am? And so the truth. And so, and where do you find the truth? You find the truth in the scriptures. John 8, 32, write this scripture down. It says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Ethan just led us in a song about God so loved the world about being free. And dealing with addiction. And a lot of that, see the link between anxiety and addiction. I can guarantee you, anybody that is is addicted to something other than God is going to have anxiety. And most people will say that their anxiety, they feed that, they take care of it by an addiction. If God's not taking care of your anxiety, then Satan will. If you're not allowing God to get you through your anxiety based upon the truth of his word, then Satan will. He's going to feed you some lie that says, well, I need alcohol to deal with my addiction. And I'm not talking about medicine. Hear me clearly. I take medicine for a heart problem, blood pressure problem. I believe that God can use medicine. If you get that, hold up your hand. So don't go off out of here and online and say, well, the pastor's telling me not to take any medicine for anxiety. Mm-mm, I'm not telling you that because I take medicine, you take medicine, we take vitamins. I, I'm not talking about that. But if I, if, if for me to say, well, I can, I can get through anxiety, but I've got to go out and get drunk or I've got to go out and get high or I've got to watch some porn to get me through anxiety or I've got to go out and have sex with all these people or I've got to curse to get me through my anxiety. I've got to blow off steam and I just say the F word, that's not going to work. If God's not getting you through your anxiety, Satan will try his best to do that, and he's going to give you an addiction. And so we've got to think what is true. What is the truth? What does the truth say to me? Okay? Now, before we move to number two, because this is anxiety and addiction, if, if you have any questions or comments, please ask them. What do you think about the truth? 
And let me say to you, and I love the world. I love the world because God tells me to love my neighbor as myself. But my love comes from God, agape love. The world is going to give you a lot of ideas about what truth is. But if your truth does not come from the Bible, it's probably not true. We've heard a lot about fake news in recent years. Okay? And, and so if somebody gives me news, I go and test the uh, sources of that news before I repeat it. I don't have to do that with God because I trust God with his word. If you do, say that with me. I trust God with his word. Say it again. I trust God with his word. Any questions or comments about truth, thinking the truth? And if you've not done Bible study, that's why we teach people on Wednesday night how to do Bible study, then you do not know how to use God's word as a source of truth. That's why we're meeting back on Sunday nights, and I'm so glad that so many of you are here. And college students that want these lessons because they do not know what is the truth. Any questions or comments about thinking truth? Okay, you've got to look it up. That's why I challenge you to talk to God daily through prayer and to get into a Bible study. Even put a reminder on your phone to give you a daily verse because you can do that. Get into God's Word and understand it and then be around God's people. And if you wonder if something's true and you do not know, ask somebody that you think knows God's Word. Truth. Okay, so we've got to think truth. Number one, number two, I've got to think the honorable. Notice verse eight. Finally, brethren, whatever is true and whatever is honorable. Okay? Now, this word honorable in the Greek New Testament, uh, some translations translate it venerable. And it, they translate it from a Greek New Testament word, simna. Simna. Okay? And so one of the... Uh, ways that I think about that is it's been vetted and it brings honor. It doesn't dishonor me. So if I'm thinking about something and it dishonors God, my neighbor, or me, then I do not need to think about it. And notice the connection between addiction. If I'm thinking about something and it does not honor God, my neighbor, or myself, then I should not do it. I deal with young people all the time, 18 to 30, that are dealing with their parents. And I have to remind them, Exodus teaches us that the first commandment with a promise is to honor father and mother. That is the Old Testament word for honor. The New Testament word is here. And the Bible says if you do not honor your father and mother, you will not live long on the earth. You honor father and mother and you have a promise, you will live long on the earth. I did not always agree with my mom and dad, but if my mom told me to do it until the day she died, I did it. Because if not, she was likely to tell me to get the belt off the hook and bend over the bed. She was going to punish me. And she loved me. And it would make me so angry after she would spank me. And the last time I got a spanking with the belt was 14. And she said, do you know how humiliating it is to spank a big old boy like you? Because I weighed 200 pounds. I said, do you know how humiliating it is to take it? And she said, well, you better take it. And the deal is, is that if it is honoring to God, to your neighbor, to yourself, then think it. If it's not honoring to God, to your neighbor, to yourself, don't think it. And most of the things that we're addicted to cause us to be dishonoring. See the connection. Most of the things that we get addicted to cause us to be dishonoring. Even if it comes to, I'm, I'm worshiping God with all of my time, that's great. Or, I would rather play my video game or be on my cell phone instead of honoring my wife, my husband, my parents, or my family. Then I'm dishonoring them. And sometimes we can be addicted to these things as people are addicted to alcohol or, or to drugs or to porn or to sex. Or to working, overworking, or to overeating. We can be addicted to overeating or undereating. And so we've got to come back and say, okay, I've got to think on what is true and what is honorable. And, if the, and it goes back to, I I've, cannot tell you as a pastor how many times I hear people say, well, I probably shouldn't say this. I want to get a recording that says, then do not say it. 
Okay, because a lot of the times when we say that, we're already going to do something that's dishonoring, that's not based upon the truth. It's what we perceive as truth. And so I've got to think about the truth and the honorable. The truth and the honorable. Okay? That's why if you go to a court and, and the laws that we have today are based upon the Judaic law system of the Old Testament. That's why if you put your hand on a Bible, you, you will swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. And that's why they call a judge who's there to see that you do that the honorable judge, whatever his name is. Honorable. We do not treat people honorably these days. I was in a place this afternoon where people were treated dishonorable because somebody didn't agree with how they were living. Whether I agree with you or I disagree with you, I should think honorable and treat people with honor. I, I deal with a lot of people that are beating themselves up. They do not honor themselves. They're rougher on themselves than they would ever be on anybody else. And that's dishonoring to God because God made you. God made me and God has all 8 billion people. God has equal amount of time for each and every one of us because of the truth, because of honor. Anxiety. If I'm going to allow God to get me through anxiety and I'm not going to fall for Satan's addictions, then I've got to think what is truth. I've got to think the truth and I've got to think the honorable. Any questions about the honorable? Now, today people think that they get a freebie if somebody's not living for God or not living according to the word of God well, I can treat them any way that I want to because they're not living for God or not living for the Word of God because they're not brothers. It's not what the Bible says. In fact, John teaches us that the Bible should know us by our what? Love. By our love. And so if somebody's not living for God and their deeds are not going along with God's Word, that doesn't give me a freebie to treat them against the truth or to treat them against honor. And this goes both with anxiety and addiction. Honor, okay? Almost weekly, sometimes two or three times a week in the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, and I read the paper daily, almost weekly, there's two or three times that there will be a person that was convinced Convicted of child pornography. God forbid. And I can almost guarantee you that if you went back and talked to them and said, what were you thinking when you first got into this pornography? They weren't thinking the truth or honorable. And they were thinking, it's okay, everybody else is doing it. Or they were thinking, I would, I would never go that far as to watch a child. And this is the world that we live in today. And that's why we have so many people shooting other people and killing other people. No truth, no honor. Number three, think right, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right. The message again this morning, James chapter 4, verse 17. Look at it with me real quick, please. Write this down so that you'll have it. James chapter 4, verse 17. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. It is sin. And so we come back and we think in this passage of Scripture, I've got to think right. How do I think right? Number one, notice the building steps. I've got to go back to truth. What is the truth? What is honorable? What is right? Oh, I might can get by with it. Nobody's going to find out. Nobody's going to tell God or my mom or my dad or my husband or my wife. Is it right? Is it honorable? Is it true? So I've got to think those ways. Now, we're going to stop here because our time is gone. 
with those three, the truth, the honorable, the right, which do you think is the most difficult for brothers and sisters, Christians today to think? The truth, the honorable, or the right? Which one do you think is the most difficult for Christians to think today? The truth, the honorable, or the right? Somebody raise your hand and tell me. Or just tell me. Honorable, why? Okay. No, we do not talk about it. Somebody else, yes, ma'am. That's exactly right. You've got to start thinking the the truth to get to the honorable, the right. Good. Somebody else. It's the most difficult for Christians today. Go ahead. Okay. Somebody else. Which is the most difficult? Some of our young people, what do you think? Honorable? Okay. Anybody else have a different opinion? I was going to say the honorable too, but especially once you get to saying about the truth, you know, it's kind of like saying no and no. So. Yeah. But if you grew up in a house with, where mom and dad painted a picture of the truth and taught you to talk to each other the way that they have talked to you or allowed you to talk to them, use the words and to fuss and fight and to be at each other's throat, then we never get to the honorable. And, and, and we learn by example. And so that's very frightening.